world news tonight. Troubled waters. The US and China have found its newest front to lock horns, this time with deepening polarization being witnessed daily. Neighboring nations call for a halt in military exercises. Economic tensions. The US stock market is navigating itself through the pre-recession period as the Bank of England sets new highs in interest rates. However, positive signs have been witnessed in falling oil prices. Asian collaboration. Developments are being witnessed in the Asian region for economic growth and prosperity amidst the tense security backdrop. And the space race. South Korea joins in an elite club in taking its targets above the atmosphere. This is Other There No World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Danilu Witanawasam. Good evening and welcome to World News Tonight. A lot to report to you and we start from Asia. China officially began large-scale drills in a retaliatory gesture following Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. Beijing's state-run Global Times framed the exercise as a rehearsal for reunification by force. A fleet comprising of the Haizun 6, China's first large patrol and rescue ship deployed in the Taiwan Strait, and another seven ships are conducting marine patrol and law enforcement activities in the waters of the south southern part of China's Fujian province. Tensions rise following U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's controversial visit to Taiwan on Tuesday. According to Chinese state media, at around noon local time, Beijing had begun the military drills it had previously warned of as a retaliatory measure to the visit. The military exercises are taking place in six zones surrounding Taiwan. They will involve China's Navy, Air Force and other departments. It will include long-range live fire shooting and conventional missile strikes, which will exclude any nuclear warheads. China's biggest ever military drills will last for four days until Sunday. China has been wrapping up the drills since Tuesday following Pelosi's arrival. It also blocked some trade with the self-governing island too. Beijing defined Pelosi's visit as political provocation and a challenge to China's sovereignty. As China sees Taiwan as part of its territory and insists it should be unified with the mainland by force if necessary. In fact, Seiran Global Times frames the military drills as the rehearsal of reunification operations. Taiwan has put its military on alert and staged civil defense drills while its ally the U.S. has numerous naval assets in the area. Taiwan previously said it will strengthen self-defense capabilities and coordination with the U.S. and other allies. Together, we will defend the rules-based international order, avoiding further regional escalation while vigorously protecting the security of the Taiwan Strait and the freedom, openness, peace and stability of the Indo-Pacific region. Amidst growing tensions with China, Taiwan's foreign ministry also urged vigilance over cybersecurity following record number of cyber attacks on government websites. Over the United States, Wall Street's main indices in ended the day mixed as global oil prices dropped to their lowest levels since before Russia's invasion of Ukraine. U.S. stocks searched for direction on Thursday with major market indexes ending the day mixed. Gains in high-growth shares offset losses in energy as global oil prices dropped to their lowest levels since before Russia's February invasion of Ukraine. Traders fretted over the possibility of an economic recession later this year that could torpedo energy demand. Adding to those worries Thursday, a warning from the Bank of England on a prolonged recession ahead. The Dow fell a quarter of a percent, the S&P was barely changed, while the Nasdaq gained nearly half a percent. Exxon and Chevron tumbled on the fall in crude prices. Although cheaper oil should come as a relief to the US and Europe, which have been urging producers to ramp up output to offset tight supplies. Shares in crypto exchange Coinbase Global jumped 10% after it announced a tie-up with BlackRock to provide its institutional clients access to crypto trading. Drug maker Eli Lilly slipped more than 2% as it cut annual profit outlook for the second time. And Facebook parent Meta Platform said it would make its first ever bond offering, its shares edged higher. Traders will shift focus Friday to the July monthly employment report. Despite a slowdown in the overall U.S. economy, non-farm payrolls are forecast to show continued strength in the labor market, with a projected 250,000 new jobs in July, following a rise of 372,000 in June. 
A legal story now, Brittany Griner, a double Olympic winner, has admitted possessing cannabis oil, receiving nine years in prison on drug charges in Russia. She had gone to Russia to play club basketball during the U.S. offseason. Caged in a Russian court, Brittany Griner hearing the crushing verdict, guilty of possessing and smuggling drugs, despite her emotional plea that it was an accident. I had no intent to break any Russian law. I made an honest mistake, and I hope that in your ruling that it doesn't end my life here. I know everybody keeps talking about political pawn and politics, but I hope that that is far from this courtroom. The judge sentenced her to nine years, just short of the 10-year maximum, and a roughly $16,000 fine. I want to apologize to my teammates, my club, Gimka, the fans, and the city of ECAT for my mistake that I made and the embarrassment that I brought onto them. The WNBA superstar was arrested in February with less than one gram of cannabis oil in vape cartridges. She said it was a mistake after packing in a hurry. Her legal team will appeal, saying the court ignored Russian law. Minutes later, President Biden calling on Russia to release her immediately so she can be with her wife, loved ones, friends and teammates. Tonight, Secretary of State Blinken and Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov both at a dinner in Cambodia, but not set to talk about a prisoner swap. We're counting on you to have that conversation and begin to put these wheels in motion. Despite Justice Department objections, President Biden has proposed trading convicted Russian arms dealer Victor Boot for Griner and Paul Whelan, an American businessman jailed for four years. Physically, he's lost a lot of weight. Uh, he hasn't seen a doctor in a long time. Russia's counteroffer sent home Vadim Krasikov, a Russian spy jailed in Germany for murder. Griner's last comments. I love my family. More stories on the economy. The Bank of England raised interest rates by the most in 27 years, despite warning that a long recession is on its way, as it rushed to smother a rise in inflation, which is now set to top 13%. The Bank of England just raised rates by the most in 27 years. Thursday saw its benchmark rate rise by a half percentage point to 1.75%. That's its highest level since 2008. Governor Andrew Bailey said policymakers were left with little choice. Returning inflation to the 2% target remains our absolute priority. There are no ifs or buts about that. The committee judged that a more forceful policy action was justified at this meeting, as there have been some indications that inflationary pressures are becoming more persistent and broadening to more domestically driven sectors. The increase comes even as the bank warns of a looming recession. Looking ahead, the BOE predicts the economy will shrink by just over 2%. It expects the contraction to start later this year and run right through 2023. Despite the gloomy outlook, the bank is widely expected to raise rates again. Markets have priced in another quarter point hike for the next policy meeting in September. Consumer price inflation is now forecast to peak above 13% in October mostly due to surging energy prices as a result of the Ukraine conflict. That would leave households facing two years of falling disposable income, the biggest such squeeze since records began in 1964. During meetings held in Phnom Penh, South Korea and the ASEAN members agreed to boost strategic dialogue to deal with regional challenges. China and Japan also took part in the sessions in a show of cooperation in areas of mutual interest. SARS top diplomat Park Jin says that summits between the leaders of South Korea, China and Japan should resume after the last edition in China in 2019. He made the suggestion at the annual ASEAN Plus 3 meeting in the Cambodian capital, which brought together four ministers of the member states, along with those of South Korea, China and Japan, to discuss areas of mutual cooperation. There, Buck also pointed out the rising challenges that all the participating members face, including supply chain disruptions and the coronavirus resurgence. The ASEAN Plus 3 is indeed well positioned to once again harness the power of joint action in dealing with new and emerging threats of this region. His counterparts from China and Japan also noted that current challenges like the Ukraine crisis, stressing the significance of the 10 plus 3 mechanism as the main channel for cooperation between Southeast Asia and Northeast Asia. 
With a view to the fundamental benefits and long-term happiness of the people in the 13 countries, we will uphold the momentum for the development of cooperation with ASEAN to achieve a new leap forward. The ASEAN foreign ministers expressed a gratitude for the three countries' support in tackling the pandemic and asked for their continuous support and knowledge sharing. Following talks with his regional counterparts earlier on Thursday, Foreign Minister Pak Tin also said South Korea is going to upgrade its strategic dialogue with ASEAN to tackle regional challenges. He said member countries will be the center of the UN administration's new initiatives, given the region's growing geopolitical importance. Also topping the agenda were North Korea's nuclear ambitions, to which South Korea said it is still strongly determined to pursue the regime's complete denuclearization through diplomacy. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Over the war in Ukraine, Ukraine said it had been forced to cede some territory in the east of the country in the face of Russian offensive. Meanwhile, three more grain ships are set to leave Ukraine today following the departure of the Sierra Leone registered Razoni on the 1st of August. This is the last Ukrainian checkpoint before the Russian border. And it's under pressure. This morning they shelled Krasnopilia. Earlier they shelled near here too. Craters are visible. They are targeting checkpoints and they're also hitting people. In Krasnopilia, the nearest town, a shell landed in this vegetable garden. No one was hurt, but the blast blew out all the windows. <laughs> Alexander says he and his wife discussed leaving a hundred times, but decided to stay partly because he's needed in the area as a fireman and partly just because it's home. In fact, the Russian troops that had occupied this region did leave, chased out by Ukrainian forces in late March. The Kremlin has since focused on eastern and southern Ukraine, but cross-border shelling here in the north has continued. This house was destroyed in June. The couple who lived here were injured, Irina says, but survived. Sumi's regional governor says the Russians don't seem to be preparing a new incursion into this region, but are maintaining the pressure for broader strategic reasons. Now, Samsung has scaled back production at its massive smartphone plant in Vietnam as retailers and warehouses grapple with rising inventory and a global fall in consumer spending. Samsung, which shipped around 270 million smartphones in 2021, says the campus has the capacity to make around 100 million devices a year. Workers in Vietnam may be feeling the effects of a global slowdown in consumer spending. Samsung has reportedly scaled back production at its massive smartphone plant there. That's according to workers at the facility. Employees at the factory in northern Vietnam told their work days had been cut to just three a week. They also said no overtime is needed. Immediately establish if Samsung is moving production to other manufacturing bases to make up for lower output from the factory. Samsung told it has not discussed reducing its annual production target in Vietnam. The company is relatively optimistic about smartphone demand in the second half of the year. It said last week that supply disruptions had mostly been fixed and that demand would either stay flat or see single-digit growth. But a dozen workers who spoke to outside the factory in the north of Vietnam said business is not good. They claimed managers had told workers inventories were high and there were not many new orders. Samsung has six factories in Vietnam, which pushes out half of the firm's massive phone output. The South Korean company shipped 270 million smartphones last year. Samsung is also Vietnam's biggest foreign investor and exporter. It's poured $18 billion into the country and makes up a fifth of Vietnam's total exports. Now, a group of UN experts said members of the Rwandan Defence Forces conducted joint attacks with M23 fighters against Congo's army and Congolese armed groups and provided the rebels with weapons, ammunition and uniforms. A United Nations group of experts says it has solid evidence that Rwandan troops have been fighting alongside a rebel group in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. That finding was contained in a confidential report seen on Thursday. Since May, fighters from the M23 group have been waging their most sustained offensive in years, killing dozens and displacing tens of thousands of people. Rwanda has previously denied Congo's allegations that it supports M23, 
and that it has sent troops into the country. M23 has also denied receiving Rwandan support. However, the UN group's report said members of the Rwandan Defence Forces had conducted joint attacks with M23 fighters against Congo's army and Congolese armed groups, and provided rebels with weapons, ammunition and uniforms. Its evidence included photos of Rwandan soldiers in an M23 camp, drone footage showing columns of hundreds of soldiers marching near the Rwandan border, and photos and videos showing M23 fighters with new uniforms and equipment similar to those of the Rwandan army. Rwandan authorities did not immediately respond to a request for comment. Congo's government spokesman welcomed the report, writing on Twitter that the truth always triumphs in the end. The M23 insurgency stems from the long fallout from the 1994 genocide in Rwanda. It was formed in 2012 to defend the interests of Congolese Tutsis against Hutu militias. A target of the M23 and Rwandan operations has been the Democratic Forces for the Liberation of Rwanda, a Hutu militia that Rwanda accuses Congo of using as a proxy. Congo's government has denied this. The UN group's report said some members of Congo's army have supported and fought alongside a coalition of armed groups, including the FDLR. Rwanda and neighbouring Uganda have a long history of military intervention inside Congo. The two countries invaded in 1996 and 1998, claiming they were defending themselves against local militia groups. Rescue teams worked to the rescue to the 10 miners trapped inside a flooded coal mine in Mexico's northern border state of Coahuila. The miners became trapped after their excavation work caused a tunnel wall to collapse, triggering flooding in three wells. Mexican President Andre Manuel López Obrador said during his daily morning conference, the municipal state and federal governments were working together to help free the miners. Several hundred local and federal officials were responding to the accident according to authorities, underscoring a firm commitment to rescuing the trapped miners, which requires pumping wells to send rescue teams down to the mines. Five other miners escaped the accident, they all received medical treatment and two have been discharged from hospital. According to the Labour Ministry, the mine which began operations in January had no existing safety complaints before. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The US government has declared the monkeypox outbreak a public health emergency following a spike in cases. The decision will speed up the distribution of vaccines, treatments and federal resources to curb the spread of the virus. It comes less than a fortnight after the WHO issued its highest emergency alert following a worldwide surge in cases. US conspiracy theorist Alex Jones should pay parents of a child killed in the 2012 Sandy Hook massacre at least 4.1 billion US dollars for falsely claiming the shooting was a hoax. The parents of a victim have sought at least 150 million US dollars in the Texas defamation trial against the Infowars founder. They said they endured harassment and emotional distress because of the right-wing host's misinformation. Aero engineer Rolls-Royce disappointed investors by reporting a bigger-than-expected fall in first-half profit, underscoring the challenge of facing its new chief executive of restoring the health of its civil aviation business. Toyota's profits slumped a worse-than-expected 42% in its first quarter as the Japanese automaker was squeezed between supply constraints and rising costs. It has repeatedly cut monthly production targets due to the global chip shortage and COVID-19 curbs on the plants in China. Despite the grim quarter, the automaker stuck to both its forecast for full-year operating profit and its plan to produce 9.7 million vehicles this year. Tens of millions of people are under heat alerts across the United States with temperatures in the 90s in all pockets of the country. Cities in the Northeast are seeing record highs and Dallas is facing triple digits for the 39th time this summer. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again on Monday for more news from around the globe. If you have missed any of the stories we add tonight, you can re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We are leaving you tonight with a brilliant development in the space race. The Korean Pathfinder Lunar Orbiter, nicknamed Danuri, meaning Enjoy the Moon, departed on SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket from Florida's Cape Canaveral USA Space Force Station. With Danuri, South Korea aims to become the world's seventh lunar explorer and the fourth in Asia, behind China, Japan and India. The launch comes as South Korea accelerates its space program seeking to send a probe to the moon by 2030 
and join nine countries working on the Artemis project aimed at returning to the moon by 2024. Thank you for joining us. Have a great night.